Welcome back to the program. David Attenborough has been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. As a young lad, I was spellbound by his earliest wildlife programs on black and white TV. Then, as a reporter in my 30s, I was thrilled to interview him. Even back then, I remember admiring the great man's energy for an old bloke. Well, we've both aged a fair bit since, and on the eve of his 90th birthday, we met once again in London. As I was delighted to discover, Sir David is still pushing the boundaries. And just as he did when I was a kid, he dazzled my senses with something new and quite incredible. This time, the cutting-edge technology of virtual reality. I'm a bit nervous about this. <laughs> Do you want to put the headset on Should first? I be? Adjust the focus for Yeah. I am about to enter another world. And who better than Sir David Attenborough to introduce me to virtual reality? That's all round. <laughs> well, there are people behind me. Amazingly, this headset turns his documentary on the Great Barrier Reef into a 3D world, with me <laughs> at the centre of it. Are you there? <laughs> that is just amazing. It's an exciting new frontier from the man who's been bringing nature into our living rooms for 60 years. Immersive is the, is the word, the jargon words they use. It's very immersive. Well, it is immersive. <laughs> really, you really feel you're there. And initially, it's rather unsettling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure people fall over if they wonder. Well, one, well it, it's quite interesting when you see them, an audience comes in, they all put on these sets, and they're all, their faces, they're all looking in different directions. They're all going, ah, and, mm, ah, and one thing or another, all with their, this thing on their heads. the Australian Museum in Sydney, the Attenborough Virtual Reality Show is a sellout. I'm here to watch them watching. Some adults stare ahead, still in the old cinema mode, but the view is all around, and it's the kids who catch on first. And David says, this is just the beginning. We haven't really started, actually, because it can take you to exciting places. I mean, uh, the bottom of the reef is fine. That's a great place. But think of going to, let's say, the middle of a herd of wildebeest, or on, on the, that river where the wildebeest cross and the crocodiles wait for them, or the middle of a penguin colony, emperor colony, in, in, the, in the, the Antarctic. Since the 1950s, David Attenborough has been a compelling guy introducing the human world to the natural one. At first, he was armed only with a wind-up camera, youthful charisma and delightful innocence. This was a great thrill for us, for as this happened, we became the first Europeans ever to see the white-necked Picathartes on its nest. As the technology improved, Sir David's television career would, of course, become only bigger and bigger. <laughs> across a series of landmark BBC documentaries. And it's coming up, it's coming up. Yeah. The blue whale is 100 feet long, 30 metres. Nothing like that can grow on land because no bone is strong enough to support such a bulk. in life at the moment is to make quite sure that he and he alone mates with every single one of them. And to that, he must fight. It's heavier even <laughs> than heavier than the adult. These parent birds reunite once they come back here onto their own patch of, patch of shingle. <laughs> But although the Antarctic is virtually lifeless over vast areas, there are one or two smaller oases that teem with life. The world's most famous naturalist had broken the mold, 
as he introduced generation after generation to the wonders of Darwinism, the science of evolution and natural selection. Is Darwinism the greatest story ever told? It's the way that makes zoology, that stops zoology being stamp collecting. Without understanding evolution and understanding what the way in which animals are related to one another, the, the natural world makes no sense. Why do some people think it was all made 3,000 years ago at 2 o'clock on Saturday afternoon? Because somebody made it up and put it in the book. Do you get trouble from those people? No. Do people ever say you haven't given due credit to the creator when you did that story well, on the hummingbird? It's very interesting that when people say, why don't I give credit? to a creator, you always use things like hummingbirds and birds of paradise and beautiful flowers and so on. But I think of a little boy sitting on a river in Africa who got a worm boring through his eyes, going to turn him blind within a few years or so. That a worm that is a species that can live nowhere else but in the eyes of human beings. And if you tell me that God made a hummingbird, I have to reply, well, he also made this worm, so you better... Um, if you want me to mention the hummingbird, I'll mention the worm as well. Um, and there's no answer to that. <laughs> Are you ready for this? Yes. You mean to say this is part of your traditions? This is one of the great Australian traditions. What did you do that for? Because we do, Dave. I've had the good fortune to interview David over the past three decades. When we started our dialogue, he had about a quarter of a century on me. Sadly, as the 60 Minutes archive clearly reveals, I seem to have been catching up with him. Let's just call it the timeless appeal of Sir David Attenborough. I still remember the time we spent in Victoria looking for and finding, that's a great thing, finding the lyre bird. The lyre bird, yeah. What bird has the most elaborate the most complex and the most beautiful song in the world. The lyre bird is wonderful. And uh, it was an amazing mimic. Amazing, too, that he mimicked all kinds of things around. Oh. I didn't hear him mimic the famous David Attenborough. <laughs> <laughs> Remember I asked you how people talk about how quietly you speak when you're doing this, and you explained to me... All I can say is that if you're within a field as closer to a, a big male gorilla as I am to you, you don't talk in a very loud voice. There is more meaning and mutual understanding in exchanging a glance with a gorilla than any other animal I know. We see the world in the same way as they do. You've lived a kind of virtual reality life, haven't you, really? Yeah. By high speed through everything you've oh, done. Well, I have to high speed uh, because life isn't long enough now. No, unbelievably lucky. I can't believe I'm that lucky. David Attenborough has seen the best the wild world has to offer. Yet, unfortunately, his work has often become a chronicle of species and natural wonders disappearing. Which brings us to the Great Barrier Reef. David first dived here in the 1950s. The first moment when you swim with, with scuba gear and see a coral reef, is one of the great moments in, in my life, certainly. Now, 60 years later, he is back in a high-tech submersible, but his sense of wonder is now matched with a sense of anger and frustration about the state of the planet. The twin perils brought by climate change, an increase in the temperature of the ocean and in its acidity, threaten its very existence. If they continue to rise at the present rate, the reefs will be gone within decades. And that would be a global catastrophe.
Where did you stand initially on the climate change argument? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that the climate change had been taking place, if only because it would be astonishing if it was not. If the human race can triple in size inside 50 mm. years, 60 years... And have no effect. And, and with no effect, mm. come on. Of course it has an effect. Um, and any place, the evidence is just overwhelming. And people say to me, why, why isn't everybody convinced? And the answer is that an awful lot of people have a great vested interest in thinking that it's not happening. Just this week, scientists reported that a horrifying 93% of the Great Barrier Reef has been hit by coral bleaching. These pictures were taken only days ago. Are you optimistic? No. Are you pessimistic? Um, I, I think the world is not going to improve. Uh, and, but I also think that um, it's no good just sitting there and washing your hands and saying, oh, well, let's forget about it. I mean, you have a responsibility to do things about it. Sometimes I think the problem is so overwhelming that people think there's nothing I can do. Yeah. Well, that's, that, that, um, and maybe so, but I wouldn't be able to look my great-grandchildren in the eye if they said to me, great-granddad, you knew it was happening and you didn't even mention it or you didn't even do anything about it or talk about it or whatever. Um, so I, I think you have a responsibility to speak up. So the grand old man of the wild world has now become its number one warrior, a champion of all creatures great and small. As David explains, we ignore even the least of them at our peril. One kind of animal is right now in the grip of the greatest extinction event since the disappearance of the dinosaurs. Animals like this, amphibians. Globally, the numbers of amphibians are declining at an alarming rate. You have done so much to popularize nature, the wonders of the world. Could you have done more? Whatever one's done, it's not enough. Of course, we shouldn't be surprised. Not in the whole history of, the, of, the, of, of humanity since the beginning of time has everybody all agreed on anything, ever. And the fact that we have got to get together in order to control climate change and so on, the world has got to get together, it shouldn't come as a surprise that it's not easy to achieve. And, but in fact, we have achieved quite a lot. When I saw him five years ago, I feared his greatest achievements were behind him. His knees were giving out and he moved with difficulty and pain. Now, about to turn 90, he's been given the gift of new knees. Put it in they can titanium knees. So they've cut you off here and here, and then put a new one. Okay, there, there. There, there, there. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, that's With the right. new knees has come a new vigor. I really feel he might outlive us all. This might be the last interview I do with you. Really? Well, could be. What's the matter with you? No, no I'm fine. You've got a problem? But we only meet every five years. Well, that's all right. I'm only 90. <laughs> right, OK. So can we go... Can we continue to meet every five years? And yeah, why not? Up, Until one of us doesn't unless, turn unless up. Unless one of you... Unless you're not feeling <laughs> too good, just let me know. <laughs>